Hey there, this is Pete Townsend from Norio Ventures. And welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialist, Top Tier Recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it's highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. This week, we talked to Gene Murphy, co-founder of the Startup Boost Global Tech Pre-Accelerator. Owen and I have both known Gene for a few years. I'm sure that a lot of our listeners in startup land have gotten to know Gene as well, as he's been ever-present in the Irish startup ecosystem for a while now. We're thrilled to have Gene on for our first video cast as well, so check us out over on the Money Never Sleeps YouTube channel. For those of you new to the show, Money Never Sleeps spelled as all one word. So, let's just give this episode a boost and accelerate right in to this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Here we go again, folks. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're recording today from the home studio. We're on with Gene Murphy, co-founder of Startup Boost, a global pre-accelerator program with a mission to lead pre-seed and seed stage startups towards accelerators, investment, and revenue. Gene is also involved with Techstars Startup Week Dublin, the Natty Fin Fintech Accelerator with Middle Game Ventures, and a big shout out to Pascal, Patrick, and Michael at Middle Game, and was previously an entrepreneur in residence at the Bank of Ireland, uh, and also the founder of multiple businesses. But just like McGreevy used to shout, enough said. I know you guys won't get that, but I'll share it another time or even talk about it later. Uh, but welcome to the show, Gene. Excellent. Great to be here, guys. And congrats on your first video cast. Yes. Hopefully it worked out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. St- stepping into uh, stepping into a new age here um, and just see how it goes, right? So, Gene, um, even with that whistle-stop tour I did of your life in crime, sorry, I mean startups, um, <laughs> There, there's a personal story we want to hear there, right? So tell us, how'd you get to this exact moment in your life? In a meandering way. I yeah, it, the, it just, just go for it, bro. The best way to start. So look, I was very lucky growing up. You know, I grew up in an entrepreneurial family. You know, our family businesses, exhibitions, conferences, and publishing. Um, I always joke with people saying the first event I went to was when I was six months of age, which was literally... Uh, the case it was my father's first ever exhibition in the RDS. Um, I think one of the first trade shows, uh, as far as I'm concerned, about 40 years ago, uh, was the Irish Heating and Ventilation Exhibition. Wow. Was, uh, I- IVEX <laughs> uh, was the uh, cutting edge technology uh, of its day. And I was pushed around that in a stroller the night before it opened, uh, getting a grand tour of it at six months of age. Um, but that's what I grew up with. You know, my first jobs were. Uh, at the kitchen table, sticking stamps on envelopes for mail shots going out the door. Me too. Uh, we were kindred spirits. Uh, <laughs> I was letting myself into my father's office when I was a kid to uh, chop up old print film, because when you used to print a magazine, it was on uh, four layers of uh, print film, so we had to send ads back to editors. There was no digital files or PDFs back then. That was another one of my jobs. And... You know, the you know, the local event venue, uh, the RDS, uh, that was kind of like a second home growing up. So as I grew up, I was always around business. That's what we chatted about at the kitchen table uh, or put stamps on, you know, sales letters going out. And through all that, um, that's what I grew up in. I had jobs in different events, got to see lots of different types of businesses, uh, good, bad, and different ones. Because uh, a trade show could have two, 300 people. And we were in every industry you could think of. Um, so if it was the food industry, it was, you know, different business people there. If it was, uh, fashion, it was, you know, different people there all the way through architecture building, you name the vertical, they were in it. And, and I think that's just something that has always stuck with me, um, is I just absolutely love business. I love the people around it, the deals that are done and how all that happens. And I think a natural extension of that was I'm the youngest in my family. And when I was about 24, 25, um, I was working in one of our magazines um, and we struck upon the idea of could we go digital with them um, and we ended up you know, launching an architecture uh, site, we launched a health and beauty site. I think I was Ireland's number one uh, male health and beauty reporter when I was 25, mostly because at that time uh, I think I was on my own uh, in that field because our editor was sick so I took <laughs> a month and got out of uh, the sales and marketing that month. But 
Learned a lot in that process. We went in to build uh, online exhibition venues then. That was another area we thought we could do something in maybe 16, 17 years ago. And unfortunately, um, that was one of my first failures uh, that I put my hand up for uh, on that. Didn't know enough, thought I knew more than I did. Had grown up in an industry. I was only speaking about this yesterday uh, at a talk. And you know, the running joke was that you, today, as we now are all online, uh, and at Boost, we've moved all of our programs remotely. Uh, one of our biggest competitors back then that we thought was a competitor um, was a piece of software I've now suddenly found myself in uh, a number of times a month. Uh, my stomach turns every time I'm in it because I always am now remembered in a daily basis, yeah. reminded of what we could have done. Again, went through that. Recession kicked in. Things didn't work out. Um, didn't realize... I suppose, looking back on it, what I'd learned or what I knew, and we're kind of scrabbling to uh, do things for people, make money, you know, what could we do on our own in that respect? Um, and I teamed up with some other people at that stage who were building websites for people. And it turns out that we'd actually learned quite a lot. Although our, you know, online magazines took six months to build, which you'd turn around in a, a weekend now at WordPress, um, you know, in going through that process, learned a lot. Uh, couldn't put the glossary of terms on it like we have today. Um, but I'd learned a lot in that process. Um, skip a few years uh, ahead on that. Uh, ended up building a little um, app to redeem uh, daily deals uh, back in the Groupon phase. Um, got to an accelerator, learned about that, went through that process. Um, and again, you know, made a mistake, tried to go from selling, you know, business to business, uh, straight to enterprise, thinking it was like in the click of the fingers, uh, it was going to be the same thing. Turns out it's not. Uh, it's a lot longer and you can mm -hmm. run out a runway a lot faster. And I think, again, through that process, had another kind of epiphany about what do I know? Do I know much? You know, what's happening? And I think, you know, skipping again another amount of years forward. Um, I think I personally just had, like, I remember my first day in an accelerator in the NDRC and I was sitting at a table. I can, I can literally remember it every time I think about it. I know where I was sitting, what I was looking at, who was sitting to my left, who was sitting to my right. Um, I was wearing a suit primarily the next day. I, I think that was the last day I wore a suit. Um, <laughs> Ever? Uh, mostly, except on my wedding day. Uh, a year and Amen. nine days ago. Um, so so that was good. So that was the second suit wearing time. Um, <laughs> Congratulations again. Th thank you very much. There may have been one or two other sporadic <laughs> yeah. moments of suit inclusion. Um, but... You know, I, I thought I knew quite a lot at that stage, you know, I've grown up in business. And again, it's, I think the thing I keep learning is, you know, what I don't know um, and trying to push that forward. I have, uh, I probably am undiagnosed and having uh, OCD and, you know, a range of other disorders where I just uh, get out of uh, shape mentally if I, I can't start and finish something. Um, and I, I think that I do like order around things. And I think that's what, you know, we try and do with Boost or where I am now, what I do. I love having an idea, getting that out into the market and seeing what happens with it and, and completing that. And that's what I love uh, working with startups. Um, it feels like, you know, when I get to chat with a startup, uh, it feels like, you know, there's a un, you know scrambled up Rubik's Cube in front of me. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that journey is little by little putting that together to try and, you know, get it to, to an end state. Either that's their pre-seed investment, that's, you know, a great sales deck that's you know that next step they need to go to so that kind of brings me up to today to literally this moment to this second uh, with both of you so I okay hope that, hope that journey's worked yeah yeah that that that's helpful thank you and I, I wanted to talk about startup boost for a bit um but do, do you think in terms of your stage and what you're naturally attracted to that obviously startup boost is a pre-accelerator that's early stage early squirrely stage right um What's the difference for you in terms of early stage versus growth stage, right? And, you know, why do you think you're attracted more to early stage than to growth stage? It's a good question. I think, I think why I like early stage is because, I, you know, again, I, growing up entrepreneurship was, I thought everyone did it. You know, I thought like that was just the norm for everyone. Um, and I was very, very lucky, you know, uh, to learn from my mother and my father and my brothers. Um, and I do think I probably got, you know, a college level degree by the time I was 18, uh, just in understanding how business worked and how to work around people, how to sell things, work with things, 
uh, organize events. So I, I think those kind of things, when you're so close to it, you take it, you know, for granted. I think what I love about, you know, startups is how rapidly can you get um, someone that's brand new to entrepreneurship um, who may have a phenomenal background in different areas. But I think, as we all know, um, you know, I don't know if it's easier if you have no business experience beforehand or, you know, how you need to rewrite that kind of mental playbook around that. But what I love about early stage to answer your question is um, the ability just to get someone uh, up into a space where they can, you know, move forward themselves. I think mm. after that, it's kind of, um, and my father said it well once was if you imagine, you know, the, the space rockets going into space in the old days, pre uh, SpaceX, uh, they had this huge orange booster rockets um, that, although I'm uh, naturally attracted to anything orange, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> the, I think that, you know, they're not the, sleekest looking things in the world, but they have no. a certain purpose uh, to get something very technologically advanced uh, to a certain point, and then they break off and they're gone and so on and so forth. Um, and then it's down to the fine-tuned jets and all the great engineering and everything to, to, to you know, for that mission to go on wherever it needs to. So I think it's incremental changes once it's, it's kind of punched through the atmosphere. And I think working with early stage startups, it feels like being those orange booster rockets, you know, on boost. And I know we'll go into more detail on this, but, you know, six weeks is three hours a week. It doesn't seem like a lot, but the, you know, the impact and the change in a startup on day one to, to the final day, um, before we go to demo day, it, it is night and day. It's as simple as that. Um, but to your point, you know, at growth stage companies and later stage companies, you need the right people with the right experience. I think the, yeah. the area I can play a role in there is just I have a good wide network uh, and I can recognize patterns. Um, and sometimes it's great to be able to chat to someone and just uncover uh, a, a little point that might you know connect them with the right person to propel them faster. Yep. And it's really interesting because I guess I'm probably myself and Peter be in the same boat. It's the earlier stage stuff gives you more scope. Like you said, the amount of change that you can kind of bring to an organization at that level in that short space of time is enormous. Like it can be, it can fundamentally change the business versus the later stage stuff. And probably given your background, it's meant that you've seen so many different parts of a business to be able to have input in all of them. And that's more valuable in some respects at the earlier stage than, you know, when they have people in those particular roles as they kind of scale. Yeah. Like uh, there's one example I'll never forget. And whenever I see the guy, I'm always brought back on a, a, a road trip down memory lane. Um, but it was one of our presidential candidates. And I don't know why his second name is escaping me, but he had a company called Smart Home. And, you know, it was, you know, I don't know, pre, uh, pre 2000. It, you know, the idea with this was it would be, it would patch your house together pre. Google, Google Nest and mesh networks and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, so every room was smart, you know, get proper uh, connectivity everywhere, get proper TVs, music, audio, all that kind of good stuff. And I remember the first year and no word of a lie, we had this stand uh, that was, you know, loving, lovingly referred to uh, by some people as the coffin uh, because it was the exact dimensions of a coffin. Uh, and um, it wasn't in the best of places. I mean, it was what it was. Um, but he was there, uh, year one. And I remember him telling me the story. He'd got his friend beside him because he had this idea and that was it. This was kind of his, his MVP and his customer development, I guess, uh, to use those kind of like phrases we'd use now. And he had a fuse box and he had like some, you know, uh, network connections, uh, inside like switches and, uh, patch cable and it was on like a, a piece of wood so it would like prop up against the stand and that was it and like one poster and i think he'd gone to the expense of painting the the wooden uh two by four black so it looked a bit <laughs> sleepy for architects and he would literally stand in the aisle dragging people in to show them why this was really important why they could charge more in their houses or, or do whatever it was that you know they needed to do and i remember seeing it and over the space of maybe four or five years he was the anchor tenant at that exhibition and the consumer exhibition. And when we went to Northern Ireland, um, you know, he was the, the main person there. And I have to hand it to him. Like, you know, the, the changes on day one that you could, you know, afford him and uh, could be some great advice that would make a monumental impact for, to, for him to move faster. It was more seasoned changes later in that career, like five years in, um, take on a new market in Northern Ireland, you know, use that exhibition to do that. Um, like that's a more expensive step to take, uh, but 
Owen, to your point, um, that is a kind of later stage step to take in that respect. And again, early stage to, to growth stage, yeah, you, know, for, you use different tools at different times for different jobs. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, just like him stepping out into the aisle, you got to do that now as a startup. It's just instead of, you know, stepping out into the aisle, you're stepping out into Twitter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Saying, hey, look at me. I'm a pretty big deal. Right. <laughs> um, I think, I think like the, the thing though is, it, you know, I, you know, all of us know each other going back a number of years now at this stage. And, you know, I think we're, we're probably of a, of a kind where, you know, we'll go to a networking event, we'll chat with people, we'll do all that. Um, but we all had to start somewhere. You know, I remember my mom giving out to me for being like too nervous uh, and uh, mm. really pushing me as an individual uh, to build up my confidence, to go out and chat to people. Um, and so again, if it's, you know, I remember someone recently at a, at a, a thing I was involved in, a very interesting lady had said, everyone needs one good person in their life at one point in time. You know, and that person may change, you know, sadly, you know, it will change if it's parents over time, or it may be a mentor, maybe someone else. But I do think it's that thing, if it's that early stage person, um, it's all brand new to them. It's all hat to, you know, three old codgers like us. Uh, <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm nearly, I'm nearly getting into my Bambi there in the middle of yeah. September. Uh, so uh, I'm starting to feel the, the aches, uh, you know, the creaks, um, but joking aside, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are going into this when it's all brand new it's all you know pretty overwhelming i think it's we're not here to do these jobs for these people um we're here to you know open a door to a room that's labeled entrepreneurship and see if they stay there or they don't you know yeah. if anything i'm a gigantic uh biological signpost uh, versus a metal one you know to help yeah. you you know get to where you need to do to be faster i think yeah, it's about boosting people forward, isn't it? Boost. Um, no pun intended, but on that note, I'm perfectly dressed. Why don't you tell us about Startup Boost? Right. Um, and yep, no, hundred percent. So, Startup Boost, interesting, interesting thing. So, myself and my co-founder Blake uh, Caldwell, who's based over in LA, uh, who who at the moment is, um, I was just chatting him to to him earlier, based over there. Um, we started this about three years ago. Uh, prior to that, um, there was a pre-accelerator called Startup Next. It was part of Up Global, which was, you know, I don't know, I want to say like nine, ten years ago, probably more. Uh, it was the originator of Startup Weekend that we all know and love uh, nowadays that helps p introduce people to entrepreneurship. Startup Next came out of that because it was the answer to the question of what do we do next? What do we do after Startup Weekend? Um, back in 2015, you know, it was bought over or acquired by Techstars. Um, and about a year later, year and a half later, it was retired by them. Um, Blake and I had, you know, run Startup Next in our own cities. You know, I ran it back, you know, for two years until it was retired. And both of us were of the opinion that, you know, it played a really valid role in a community uh, or in an ecosystem. Um, and that's something that we wanted to not see go away. So with everyone's blessing, we set it back up um, year one. We wanted to see if we could do it. Uh, we recruited some uh, phenomenal city directors um, in London, Dublin, LA, uh, Detroit, and Toronto on our first ever one. Um, they all ran and we run two cohorts a year. So that was the first cohort. Uh, year two, we got to year two, uh, mostly to try and repeat year one. So it wasn't a fluke. Uh, and from that, uh, we introduced things like you know, online demo days so we could increase the, the level um, of you know, visibility of our cohort. So they'd run their demo day, we'd record their videos, we'd go and edit it. Um, and then from that, uh, we get another bite of the cherry for those teams, maybe six weeks later online. Uh, big demand, you know, big interest. We got some really great investors to go to those. Um, and year three, this year we thought our big foray into, you know, helping more people uh, was going to be increasing our programs um, and launching a platform called BoostX uh, with the tagline of, uh, helping any founder anywhere uh, take the next best step in their business. Um, it's an online community. Uh, any you know founders can apply to get an invite to go to it. Uh, they get access to workshops from all our different cities. They get a community of other founders that they can chat with, curate a content, perks, all these kind of great things. And then COVID struck, uh, as it struck everyone. Um, you know, it doesn't you know distinguish between uh, things when it, when when it hits. Um, 
And about three weeks before we began our spring cohort, I remember walking down the street um, and I was on you know, the phone to Blake because we you know, call for about two hours every day. Um, and I was walking back home and I, I'll, it's like most of those things in life. You remember when you know, something really big hits and, and that was a big thing for us. And I was just at Fitzwilliam Park um, and we called. And the day before I said, what happens if like, you know, our event venues don't want to run events? What if suddenly there's these lockdowns that people are, are kind of murmuring about? And when he rang me, we'd started getting emails in um, on American time of venue after venue just going down like dominoes uh, saying, sorry, we can't support you. And there's nothing like it's no venue's fault. You know, those people still stuck by us with some great mentors and speakers and we're very fortunate. But, you know, we knew the writing was on the wall then. Um, and I have to credit Blake, absolutely love working with him. Uh, worked around the clock, reviewed 35 different online platforms, one of which shall not be named. Um, <laughs> and wow, uh, we, it's made that much of an impact. 35 life. platforms. And it was very quick. We had this yeah. list put together and immediately we re removed, I'd say, two thirds of them. If it was out of our budget, if we couldn't get back from uh, get an answer back from customer support within 24 hours, if it just um, was too many jumps uh, to get to where we needed. Uh, and then the next ones, we started doing demos. In the interim period, we started rewriting workshops, playbooks, processes, started training up. Um, we ended up making a short list of about three and went with a really great platform called remo.co um, with a backup of Zoom as a, a, a in the background. Um, but, you know, we were able to run uh, in five cities. Our city directors rallied to the, the, the challenge. Uh, there's a lot of lessons learned through all that. Um, we were able to pre-accelerate 37 startups, which we'll have some news on shortly on some of the um, funding they've raised and some of the accelerators they've got to in the meantime. Um, and then wrap that up with an online demo day with a uh, with our partner, paperstreet.vc, which we use for investor reporting for our startups. We train them on that in week five. Yeah. Um, but they'd gone into virtual demo days uh, or online demo days. Um, and again, that's probably one thing we do differently is not run five demo days in five different cities on one day. Uh, <laughs> yeah, our, I can imagine. When it's yeah. offline, we always love running everything at the same time because it's, you know, there's that camaraderie. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if leaping between cities in the States and uh, from Canada to North America uh, in five different bands is the thing to do. <sighs> yeah, I saw oh. that Chicago, LA, New York City, Pittsburgh, and Toronto. Yeah. In one day, I think thirty-seven. I, think I ended up wrapping up with a conversation with one of our guys, Adam Horn, who's based in Chicago and a huge kind of uh, mentor to me in re in respect of entrepreneurship ecosystems. I remember, I was having a chat about half three in the morning my time, but it was about like half nine his time, and I, I don't think I slept till about six, half six in the morning. And I've been up since eight. Uh, you know, adrenaline is pumping. Yeah. We, we got it done, you know, and it was phenomenal to see the startups get the opportunity to showcase. It is different. Online to offline is is different. I can't sugarcoat uh, that. You know, there's things we've learned, you know, from our feedback and, and areas of still want to know more about. Uh, and we're researching now to improve our programs. Um, but um, that was where we got to, you know. Okay. All right. And we, we talked about this a couple times on the podcast recently, Owen, didn't we, in terms of the whites of the eyes type conversation, right? Yeah. And I looked into a little bit further afterwards and found out that when you're connecting with somebody, your pupils subconsciously dilate. Mm -hmm. And the other person subconsciously notices that. And then subconsciously, you're connected, right? And that there's something that happens with a human connection. Now, um, someone got right up into the Zoom camera to me a couple of weeks ago just to say, look, my pupils are dilating. I'm like, whatever. Um, <laughs> but how do you actually you know, mentor to startup, you to startup, um, you know, how do you actually bridge that gap over a camera to really have an impact? So I think that the, the thing we all have to kind of have a, you know, our kind of hand joining exercise and say, you know, it's not going to be the same and trying to kind of chase that impossibility as far as I've seen yet of trying to do that. And again, look, you can say I'm biased on that because I grew up in events and that's what, you know, I was taught since I was a kid. But online to offline are two different experiences. And I think, you know, we've tried to replicate to the best of our ability that things that we did were, 
you know, we opened up our Remo venue specifically for the cohort for six weeks so they could use those, uh, like, you know, Remo's cool in that you can run uh, conferences, talks through that. It has tables. Every team would have their own table, their own whiteboard. Um, and it is a really good system, but we'd also have like one-to-many talks when it was the key speaker. The way it breaks down is every week there's a key speaker on one of our six pillars and uh, there's pitch uh, coaching. And then the final area is one-on-one mentorship. Um, so in those areas, we could break people onto separate tables. They would chat, you know, similar to this. Um, we tried to do things like inviting the alumni in for an hour beforehand and an hour afterwards and just get them mixing and, and chatting. Um, it's still, though, the case that people are, I think people are wary of, not wary, but they're conscious of online. Um, I think, you know, if we all, you know, admit it here, um, you know, this is a super format and it's a great app that you found and definitely bridges, a, a, you know, a series of different areas in the gap. But if we're still online, it's still being recorded. It's still, yeah. you know, right in front for, you know, critical uh, feedback uh, for hundreds of years, you know. Um, so how do you have those conversations? I don't have the answer to that. And it's something that, you know, you know, Blake and my, you know, the role of Blake and I, I suppose, you know, to sum it up is um, our goal is to, to facilitate uh, pre-accelerators. So we work with phenomenal volunteer city directors. Uh, we have a playbook we're always refining. We provide the tools for all that um, so that we can reduce the, the burden so that they can spend more time with their teams. Um, you know, I don't know what the future is going to hold. I know we're going remote for the rest of the year um, and until it's safe to do so to come back. And maybe even then, uh, maybe it'll be, you know, a remote option, an in-person option and a hybrid option. Um, so again, there's a lot of lessons we've learned out of that. There's some interesting stuff happening, but I think the thing is, if anything, to use terminology, I love, sadly, I believe that in COVID, um, with regards to that, we're in the pre-seed phase. Um, and I don't think I, I really, um, yeah, I really don't think that we're going to be out of this, uh, in the next one to two years, I just, mm. you know, personally, I don't, I do think what we're going to see is much like the financial crisis. You know, we're going to see, you know, it was what, you know, 12 months to 24 months later after that happened. Um, it, you know, from my opinion, uh, is that when we started seeing that level of innovation that was spurned on by that, you know, coming to the market, um, maybe it'll be faster because tools are faster to build with now than ever before. Um, but in saying that, I, th I think maybe if we had this conversation again in six months, we may have, you know, another round of technology. I think we've been in triage with some of the, the technology that we've had, like Zoom, Google Hangouts, and they've done a phenomenal job and they've probably done more than they were designed for. Um, but now I think we're starting to see features that are making it easier for people. Um, so I think the, the answer is that there's not an answer yet, in my opinion. But again, if you do yeah. find these or it comes back in, you know, from listeners, I would absolutely love to know. Yeah. Look, I wanted to pick up on something actually, because it's something you mentioned a good bit. Um, mentors, kind of a keyword that you mentioned. Who in your, because I'd be keen to know from your experience, who have you found as your kind of some, some of the mentors? And then what do you try to bring as a mentor or how much value do you see from a mentor kind of role to some of the companies then that you work with? Yeah. I mean, I think with mentoring, it's, you know, what we love by the end of the program is that. You know, our teams know how to work with mentors and they've been exposed to that and they can understand what happens. And I think, you know, the value of the role of a mentor is that, you know, we're lucky that we can call each other, get advice. Um, and, you know, we see it that like some of our teams have never had that experience or don't have access to those networks. Um, so I think, you know, the importance of mentorship is, you know, subject to, uh, sorry, with the caveat that you've found good mentors um, and they're not, uh, you know, dialing it in, don't know what they're doing, yeah. are not passionate about what they're doing. Um, and we have ways that we go and find, you know, good mentors. And again, I should say that that is, uh, I don't want to sound like some, uh, you know, uh, Wizard of Oz omnipotent being uh, where we wave our, uh, our hands and suddenly mentors pop up in all those cities. You know, first and foremost with Boost, it's uh, built and fold by great city directors. Um, you know, it's their networks they're reaching into. They know those people that are passionate. So it's, it's again, I suppose, the people coming into those networks, you know, one are coming in through those individuals. Um, so they're pre-qualified in that respect because, 
you know, I put a good bit of work up front with our city directors to make sure they're the right people, um, that they have access to those networks. Um, and then I think from that, you know, we get uh, reviews and ratings uh, on each of the startups and each of the mentors each week. So that gives us a good idea of that. And again, you know, our teams are good and vocal uh, and that'll pop up quite quickly. Um, so again, we rely more online now uh, on those because you don't have the ability to walk around a room um, and spot people and see how they're doing. Um, so in answering that, that's our process for it. Um, what's the importance of mentors? I don't know. I like, I think a good mentor is someone who's incredibly passionate about an area they're in. Um, and they know that if they're chatting with someone, um, who is excited or is looking at, you know, is excited about, you know, something new that they can do, disrupt whatever, you know, word that, that you want to do, you're most comfortable using, uh, they're going to learn something in the process. You know, whenever I love working with startups because I get to learn about new technologies, new ways they're doing things. Why are they doing it this way? Um, it's one thing to get it from the news or try and get it from Hacker News or Twitter or whatever it is. It's another thing to, to you know, be able to have a conversation that goes both ways. And if I've been able to help someone, I know that I can rely on them for help in the future as well. So I, I think an, a mentor is a perennial learner. Uh, I think it's different to a coach, um, but... Yeah. And that's fine. And, you know, and the mentor can be a coach and a coach can be a mentor. I think it is about you want to give something. Um, and then, you know, by doing that, um, you get something back because it has to, there has to be some exchange in some way, shape or form, even, even, even if it's in the future, uh, not necessarily right now, but, you know, I, I hope that kind of is, is kind of a good insight into my view on mentorship. And who, yeah, who have yeah, you is. seen, who's been your kind of mentor or you've probably had different ones over the years in terms of as you've been going through and working on different things. Yeah, I think like I definitely have. I mean, look, as a kid growing up, you know, I was a uh, uh, 15, 16 years younger than both my brothers. So, you know, I had four mentors in the house, mom, dad, uh, my brother, uh, Alan, and my brother, Jared, and they all taught me lots of different things. Um, I think, you know, moving into college, you know, our head of our student union was a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal lawyer nowadays, uh, but she, you know, was uh, Jay McGuire. I always remember she was a, a big influence in me got me involved in that, got to be president there, got to do some really good stuff. Um, you know, I think like every year or two I've always gone, to, like there's been another mentor there for me. Um, and again, I suppose, um, you know, even my co-founder, you know, years ago, uh, Jay Dallison O'Connor, when we built Redeem and Get Together and we built like websites together and we traveled into some different companies together, um, you know, always learn from her, you know, on a number of different aspects and area. Uh, areas um i think like as i said earlier i think there's different mentors at different times yeah. and i think it's you can always like depending on depending on what you need at that time or what you want to learn there's always going to be someone that can mentor you in one way shape or form you know i'm lucky nowadays uh i get you know you mentioned them earlier uh pascal michael um uh and patrick you know the guys in middle game ventures do get to learn a lot from them. That's one of the reasons why, um, you know, it's it's great to have the opportunity to to work on Nadafin with them. Um, is that there's some areas there that I don't have an understanding of or learning on, um, and you know I can learn from that. And equally, you know, I think if you pair with a good co-founder that's different to you, you know, there's you know it's gonna be extra work. But I think it's you know it's yin and yang, day and night, on and off. Um, you know, you will learn something in the process of switching between one and the other. So again, by giving you a laundry list of mentors, I think I think it's like that that professor from UCD said at that event was, you know, you know, everyone needs one good adult uh, in their life at one at one point in time, at, yeah. at different points in time. I think is what she was meaning, or what I've taken from it. And uh, and again, you know, there, I hope that answers that. Absolutely. Yeah. And do do you, do you find yourself kind of continuing in an informal mentorship role for some of the alums of the program? Yeah, we're trying to. I mean, one of the, you know, an asset to us is our alumni because they're chatting with other people. We hope that, you know, on Boost, you know, I should say it's no fee charge, no equity taken because it's at that pre-accelerator phase. And um, what we want people to be able to do is to, you know, instill their learnings in others as well. That's the benefit I got. Um, and I think that's kind of what was, you know, born from my time at NDRC. Learned a lot there. Um, really great alumni uh, from that. Um, but, you know, what we do, uh, you know, it was tough to try and do that because, it's a, you know, it's as a volunteer-based uh, uh, program, 
it's a lot to ask, I feel anyway, um, our city directors to be actively, you know, uh, mentoring people. Um, post-program, Blake and I run office hours once a month for Boostex members and then also separately for our alumni. Okay. Um, inside that platform, there's a, a specific area that's uh, private only for alumni uh, where they get access to their alumni perks, which are a little different to other perks. Um, they get access to, you know, different information that's in there. Um, and that's one thing that we're working on. And we also, um, are going to be chatting with our alumni about the, the ability for them to be able to give back into that community, um, and either share their story in a, you know, podcast, um, about their journey, uh, or actively keep an eye on cohorts of our Boost X members, because we ask members every month, what's a big, you know, uh, rock in your way. And by getting those questions, we can see how we target our content or curate our content and actively listen to that audience. And again, that's only in its infancy, but that's something where we want to bring the alumni back in. And again, so uh, we'll be able to support them in a, in a much better way using online tools um, and then also uh, help them reflect their learnings back into a community. So it's kind of, it's not self-perpetuating, um, but it is getting a kind of a wide kind of coverage or shield uh, of knowledge that's been able to help all those different companies. And do you think is it is it a natural personality trait? Because like we we, had, we were we had chatted there on Monday for about an hour, and we were chatting away, and I was bouncing ideas, and you kind of naturally, I think, like to like to help and give guidance and kind of mentor where you can. Is that just I'm some... terrible with, with <laughs> real world Rubik's cubes? But I love your Rubik's cubes that you you, you present. <laughs> um, I think. I think it's a personality trait and I think it's a good thing and a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, and I learned that about myself uh, over the past, you know, number of years is that I'm driven to find solutions to problems. Um, yeah. And I really, really enjoy it. And I think it can, you know, look, as you can all imagine where I'm going with this, you know, if you're always looking for solutions to problems, sometimes people just want to uh, chat and listen. So I can be yeah. an a, a egregious bore sometimes uh, or, or very frustrating. Uh, when someone's telling me they don't want, uh, they don't want my help, but they want me to listen. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so, and that's something I, I need to also dial back on because again, you can spend forever trying to help people um, and not get any of your own stuff done. But look, you know, I always, I always do enjoy. Obviously, always love our conversations. Um, but it is exciting when you know people are working on something, and it's just that passion that's there. You know, yeah. I don't know in the future we'll have. Uh, like that, what's it, that Rowdy Roddy Piper movie, They Live. Uh, <laughs> and you'll be able to put these specs on and you'll be able to see the you know, the incarnation uh, of, of entrepreneur passion popping off people. Maybe that's a magic leap thing. They've got that new seat. Yeah, it could be. So maybe, maybe that's an app. Maybe we should do that. I think I think so. No, I'm, I'm totally intrigued by all of this because I just started doing some mentorship recently. Uh, for Enterprise Ireland, Owen, um, Excellent. Of, of all organizations. Yeah. So, and it's going well and I'm enjoying it. But one of them said to me, um, you're the first mentor that I've had that listens more than you talk. Right. Interesting. Um, which, 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 you know, and, and this person was new to the mentorship program as was I, Owen. So um, no slight there. But anyway, what I found is that the more you get to know people, the harder it is just to listen because you get so comfortable with them and you and you know them and you want to kind of like use that knowledge of their personality to kind of steer them in the right direction and probably perhaps oversteer sometimes, um, you know, and that it takes real discipline. And I did this with somebody about a year ago that I knew really well, where it was like I had handcuffs on by just asking questions like and not making statements. Mm -hmm. And every question followed another question, like the five whys that you do and you know, product development, trying to do that when you're mentoring somebody, it is so hard. And that's where it kind of spills over into coaching a bit that that um, Paul Smith uh, talks about quite a bit. So do you find that at all, that the more you get to know somebody, the more likely you are to to talk rather than to listen? Is that is that a thing? I, you know, I'm, I'm obviously uh, held back by the fact that I'm Irish. So we'll end up going into a meeting <laughs> and chatting for 55 minutes about absolutely nothing. And then, you know, have this mad dash uh, at the end, uh, completely exasperated, trying to like actually figure out what the business is. Uh, like I, I remember years ago, um, the, you know, I was working in the golden pages and I brought our CEO, a really great guy, uh, Carl, 
um again you know like all these people like you know had a great call with them about two or three weeks ago catching up hadn't spoken in a year uh again another you know to your point earlier on another mentor in that respect um and just catching up on where i was and getting his advice and i remember this lady sat down i think she was from eventbrite when they were opening up here and you know we sat down and you know i, I thought that'd be like some really great way for us all to work together and i remember the minute we sat down within like 30 seconds uh, she turned around and said, okay, so why are we all here? What's the business we can do? And we were all flabbergasted saying, well, I thought we were going to have a great chat. And yeah. then like had this mad dash in the last five minutes. So I, I think, you know, to your point, and I've obviously completely illustrated it here, um, is, um, is it, look, it's a tough one. I think, look, if you're, if you're noticing that about yourself, I think that shows, you know, a good level of kind of self-awareness, you know, what's important for that company. Uh, because, you know, time is the resource that we all jokingly say is most important, but actually is, and we never have enough of it, and we can't create any more of it. I think, I always say with mentorship, it's kind of like your Dr. Fraser Crane, uh, and, you know, the person has the answers there, and you have to, like, help them find the questions to get them out. And I think, totally. I, I think it can be, like, you can have some really brutal uh, mentorship sessions sometimes where, you know, if someone's coming back asking the same thing three times, uh, after, you know, over a number of weeks, you know, Either am I not making the impact? Are they finding new things to do? Uh, are they not, you know, prioritizing? So I think as a mentor, the the more you mentor, um, and uh, the more you and the more seriously you take yourself, the more time you're going to put into improving that. I mean, mentoring a phase one, you know, I have two emails in today uh, from people uh, that reached out through LinkedIn, um, and again, my question now to everyone is: I'm um, happy to take the call. What's the one question you want to ask? Uh, and, and just, I want to go to that prepared because I don't want to let them down. I don't want to like give someone, um, like I always say, like obviously all, all chats are still the person has to live and die by their own choices, but I don't want to be messing someone around. You know, I just don't. I, I know how frail business can be. Um, especially, you know, in the early stages uh, where it's minute to minute. So I, I do think to your point, it's, there's different phases of mentorship. And I think being self-aware of, you know, this is someone's uh, incredibly important time on both sides of the table and um, that neither should come unprepared to it. Yeah. Like I, I, I had a chat just yesterday that with a founder where I wish I could had could have had a do-over, right? I just flubbed because I was probably trying to overlay way too many of, you know, thoughts of what I would do with the situation instead of figuring out what was the right thing for that founder to do at that point in time. Right. So I said, listen, give me a call tomorrow and we'll talk about it again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and sometimes it is to get that do over. Yeah. But just to take the kind of time out and come back to it. I remember Connor Murphy, it was Connor Murphy had said, I was reading some tweets on, uh, it was about fundraising a few years back uh, when he was, you know, um, MD at Techstars in Berlin. And I was at a talk. Um, he was saying, say, there's one interesting one where it was about, you know, if you're fundraising, you should set up a wiki about the questions you're being asked and share that with your company so everyone can learn, you know, the pressure you're under, the questions you've been asked, what people are thinking of the product, what people are thinking of the market. I thought that was very smart. And you also made a really good point was, you know, we're always trying to have the best side out um, and, you know, trying to answer things in a knee-jerk reaction, which I've been, you know, I, I can put my hands up and say I've done. Um, I felt like an absolute uh, eejit afterwards. Um, and, you, you know, you don't feel you can come back from that. And, and just take the time out to be able to say, let me come back to you on that and just and, and taking that that breather out so i, I completely agree with you on that you know I, yeah. still, I mean i'll always get it like it, yeah like i said sometimes due to a relationship with somebody if you know them so well that it's like you just go right yeah um, yeah no you're completely right uh, you know. you're completely right i do agree with you on that all right guys we could probably chat for hours i mean i, I don't know how long we're on yet peter how long are we recording we're we're at about 42 minutes <laughs> um <laughs> Easily, so Gene, we we did that the other day on a call. We chatted for and like at the, the last five minutes, it's like, oh, uh, was there anything specific? <laughs> oh my god! Have you guys met Rory Guinan from Endeavor yet? No, I think so. I think no. Rory. Shout out to Rory. Like I've had two meetings with him uh, that were both scheduled for a half hour, and like ninety minutes later, we're like still going. And then he introduced me to uh, Faye Walsh Druyard from Wake Up Capital, 
And like it, the same thing started happening. <laughs> so we're going to get her on the podcast yeah. as well and, and see how things go with that conversation. Well, but I, uh, I have two questions. Uh, uh, first one, I suppose, is, you know, what's the next six, six months look like? I won't say 12 months because God only knows what that means for any of us. But, you know, what, what's the next six months for Jean in Jean's world? And then I'll fi- I have a separate question for after. <laughs> uh, I like it to be called G-Town. Um, <laughs> Fair enough. But, uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, Jean world is fine. Um, but next six months ahead, um, keep the best side out, stay indoors, wash your hands. Uh, <laughs> I think it, it, it's a repeat of the first six months of the year. Um, you know, with Boost, I think we're going to be coming up on our, our biggest amount of programs yet. Uh, applications are launching 20th of July. Um, we've got uh, Global Investor Day, 27th of July, which is going to be all of our teams from the spring cohort, one day, one place, uh, you know, one pitch. Um, we are some exciting stuff with our first ever Vancouver program. Uh, we're in uh, Newcastle uh, as well in fall in the northeast of England. Um, and our first ever new continent, uh, we're going to, uh, we have two programs uh, in Africa, one in really? Zambia uh, and one in Kenya. Um, so that's very exciting. Um, our goal is to add five more cities uh, till we hit a kind of upper limit. Um, we've had 141 cities reach out over the last three years. Wow. Uh, we're kind of at about 11, 12 now. Uh, and it was a slow start for us. We wanted to make sure we could do it the right way and wouldn't let people down. Um, we're getting more automated. That's getting better. Um, so on our programs for fall, getting ready for those now. Um, that's going to be exciting. That's a lot of work. Um, we've got um, Boost X is going to be getting bigger and bigger. So we're going to be opening up that more and more out of our beta. Um, so that's exciting. Um, yeah, and personally, I just uh, try and spend a little bit more time with the family because it, I think that's one of the dangers I've definitely succumbed to is in the bag at Belfry here. Uh, I've converted <laughs> a spare room uh, to a uh, a home office slash YouTube influencer channel, although <laughs> uh, but, not, um, but you know, in saying that, um, you know, it's great we're getting through an awful lot, but need to be able to just manage my time uh, more. I heard a good one today it was work life integration uh, because it shouldn't be a balance. It shouldn't be one fighting against the other for balance in oh, yeah. a certain way. So uh, that's the second time I've listened to that podcast. So I'm going to listen to it again tomorrow uh, and see. Uh, what else I can take from that. So yeah, big, big, big things going on with Boost. Very excited about that. And then on top of that, uh, we're going to have uh, Nadifin uh, back for um, uh, the uh, fall. So that's going to be exciting. So working with some really good Great. team there. We'll be reaching out to, to you guys. We'll have more info on that soon. Um, but yeah, making a big impact there as well. Um, yeah, so it's going to be exciting with Middle Game Ventures. You definitely want to watch. Brilliant. And my last question, which we always use to, to wrap it up, tell us something people wouldn't expect to know about you. Well, I kind of inferred it earlier when I was uh, Ireland's number one male health and beauty reporter. <laughs> uh, I'm still convinced I was the only one uh, back then. Uh, I remember uh, part of the job was going out to see you know different launches of different salons. And it was a, it was a website for salon owners. It was called SSH.ie, Salon Spas and Health. I loved it. It was a great business. Just didn't put an, uh, enough focus onto it. We had that, uh, the online exhibition venue. We had Archie Expo. Again, you know, I think uh, very timely. Um, but I remember this uh, new IPL machine uh, was coming. I still have the terminology. Um, and uh, the minute they saw me, they're like, "We have to try. You have to try this new machine." I was like, "I don't know what I'm doing. Let's go." Uh, and I remember the lady was, you know, running this. Um, you know, it, it fires like water and salt at your face. It's, you know, remove a layer of skin. Um, she she said. Uh, said it, it hurts a little bit and she said well you know I haven't really tested this out yet so uh, <laughs> we dial it up to 10 and see what happens um, so that was exciting so that, that, <laughs> anyone knew that I nearly had most of my face removed at one stage uh, in the pursuit of uh, great journalism uh, in the salon spa and health industry <laughs> wow we are amongst greatness Owen yeah it's brilliant awesome all right. Well, Gene, thanks so much yes, for coming thank on. Thank you show. very much. It's great to have you here on our very first was, video podcast. I think you deserve a round of applause for your first ever video. <laughs> hey. Love Master of the sound effects as well. Brilliant. Gene, thanks so much. And we'll catch up with you thanks. soon, buddy. See you soon, guys. Good luck. Money never sleeps, pal.
That does it for this week, folks. And thanks to Gene for opening up his mind to help us figure out why he does what he does. Links and show notes for this episode are on moneyneversleeps.ie. So check us out online and you can subscribe to our newsletter on moneyneversleeps.substack.com. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting or retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for editing this podcast. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening and for watching. See ya. Money never sleeps, pal.